Hello and welcome back to An Old Man Watches, where today I'm going to be talking about the 1972 horror film Terror at Red Wolf Inn, uh, which you can also find under other titles, including Folks at the Red Wolf Inn, Terror House, and my personal favourite, Club Dead. Uh, and in this film, we meet college student Regina, who gets a letter informing her that she has won an all-expenses-paid vacation at the Red Wolf Inn. Regina phones the number on this letter, uh, but despite her protests that she didn't enter a competition, the person on the phone is very insistent that she's won it. They're also very insistent that she must take the prize immediately. A charter flight is waiting at the airport right now, and if Regina delays, she will miss it and she will not get the prize. Now, I think in the modern day, if this happened in real life, I think most of us would immediately be like, there's something fishy going on here, some kind of identity theft or phishing scam, maybe. But this is a 1970s horror film. So while Regina should be a lot more suspicious of this apparent windfall, she does decide to the airport. There wouldn't be much of a movie if she didn't. And what she's going into is a significantly more macabre situation than identity theft. In any case, the plane takes her to a remote rural restaurant destination where Regina is greeted by the handsome but slightly odd young man named Baby John Smith. Baby John takes Regina on quite the thrill ride as they go to the inn, speeding through town and evading the police. Uh, it turns out, though, that Regina herself has a bit of a wild side. She enjoys this chase rather than being afraid, which sparks hints of an infatuation from Baby John. Upon arriving at the Red Wolf Inn, Regina meets the inn's proprietors, who are Baby John's grandparents, as well as two other guests, both attractive young women like herself. The whole situation seems quite idyllic, with comfortable rooms and delicious home-cooked meals. But well, like I said, this is a horror movie, and as Regina will soon come to realise, accepting this supposedly free holiday has put a lot more at stake than just her credit card details. So this film was written by Alan J. Actor. Um, it's his only credit on IMDb, so if he ever wrote any other scripts, they never made it to production. Um, it is, however, directed by Bud Townsend, who did make other movies, the most notable of which was the 1976 X-rated musical parody adaptation of Alice in Wonderland. And I do genuinely mean both that it was X-rated, as in not given a classification, though an R-rated version does also exist, and that it was a musical. It contains a full suite of song and dance numbers written and choreographed just for this production. Apparently inspired by the success of sex parody Flesh Gordon, Alice in Wonderland's R-rated cut uh, would go on to rake in a reported 90 million at the box office. That's about half a billion dollars in today's money, which at the time of recording is enough to be 2024's fifth highest grossing film worldwide. So, yeah, it was a very different time, the 70s. Terror at Red Wolf Inn, on the other hand, enjoyed far less success. And while it's not without some positive features as a film, I'm not surprised that it didn't exactly pack in the audiences. But more on the movie's virtues and flaws in a moment. First, let's talk about what kind of film it actually is. Because a number of film critics and scholars have described this film as an early example of comedy horror, noting its instances of tongue-in-cheek humour. Uh, and that's led to the film being outright classified as horror comedy on IMDb. Uh, but in my opinion, that's a somewhat misleading appellation. Yes, the film packs in a lot of arch wink at the audience innuendos about the nature of its villains, so much so that you'd have to be pretty much asleep not to figure out that they're cannibals within 10 minutes of meeting them. And yes, there's a gonzo five-second post-credit scene. But this movie isn't exactly yakety sax material. If you go in expecting overt jokes and wisecracks in the manners of a Ghostbusters, you're very much going to be in the wrong headspace. This is wry grin material at most, and is very much more a horror movie than a comedy movie. You know, I mean, if you've seen some slashes and you know how they've kind of got funny bits from time to time, it's it's that kind of horror comedy. It's really a horror movie with a few with a few funny moments, basically. And most of them, as I said, they're more in the wry grin than laughing out loud kind of thing. Now, one thing that probably bolsters the film's claims to horror comedy status is that director Bud Townsend demonstrates some skill in achieving an unsettling or even gross out tone without just resorting to lashings of explicit gore. So he's able to keep the graphic on-screen content fairly light. Uh, in fact, he showed such deafness and restraint in implying rather than showing gory content that with only a couple of very small edits, the film, which was originally released with an R rating, was subsequently reissued as a PG film. Uh, and the cast also do their part in selling the film's 
actually quite tame content. They have to. If you can't gross people out with graphic blood and guts, you have to creep them out with atmosphere. Line delivery and acting performances are going to be a key part of that. Now, there probably aren't any names in the main cast that you'd recognise, uh, but it's quite possible that you'll think a couple of the faces look familiar. Uh, Arthur Space, who plays Baby John's grandpa, racked up nearly 300 on-screen credits in a 40-year career, while Margaret Avery, who plays one of Regina's fellow guests, went on to appear in The Colour Purple, as well as many other films and TV shows. Terror at Red Wolf Inn was one of her first credits, and as of the time of recording this video, more than 50 years later, she's still active as an actor. Um, so yeah, you may well say, they seem familiar. And they're, they're good at their job, and they do a good job of selling the atmosphere. Unfortunately, and you knew that there was some kind of but coming, didn't you? Uh, the film's positives are rather squandered by the absurdity of the core concept. The script requires Regina and the other two victims of the cannibals to be almost willfully stupid in not realising that something weird is going on at the inn. A script that relies on characters being this oblivious is a script that needs rewriting. Then there's the fact that the cannibals' methods seem very flawed. After winning the competition, quote unquote, Regina has time to go outside and shout out the news to her whole dorm. Nobody seems to care much, but if she'd had friends or acquaintances nearby, they'd presumably have asked questions and then known where she was going. You know, you would think after a few guest slash victims, it would seems like someone would notice that a lot of people are vanishing when they visit this inn. And we haven't even got to the question of how the cannibals find and select their victims in the first place. They're basically just one family. So how are they locating young women like Regina who, you know, live some distance away and who presumably don't have partners or jobs or other encumbrances to stop them from dropping everything to come to the inn. Now, certainly you could turn off your brain and just enjoy the film's creepy atmosphere and amusingly twisted conclusion, but I feel like you shouldn't have to. The script should do a better job and the basic setup should have been and has been in other films executed better than it is here. You know, just do it better, guys. And this would actually have been a fun little film. As it is, you know, you really do have to overlook some fairly big problems to turn your brain off and enjoy this. Next time, one of the most famous silent movies ever made, the German expressionist science fiction classic Metropolis from 1927. But that is for next time. For now, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you've seen Terror at Red Wolf, Red Wolf Inn, let me know what you thought of it.